Okay, everyone, so this is the last uh, part of the rotational kinematic section. Uh, so far, we've talked about uh, angular displacement and how uh, we could figure that out and how that works with the linear stuff. We've talked about converting from linear values to angular values. Uh, and then we moved over into uh, talking about the angular uh, velocity and the angular acceleration uh, and all that stuff. So there's one last thing that I want to talk about, and um, that's this idea of what other things can we uh, put angular versions of. You know, does force have an angular version? Since, if you recall, in the linear case, the whole concept of having an acceleration meant, because of Newton's laws, that we had to have had a force. You can't have an object accelerating and changing its motion unless there is a force applied to it, a net force. So, does the same thing apply for the angular case? If we have an angular acceleration, does that mean that we have to have an angular force involved? And the answer is yes. In fact, we have a name, it's called torque. So, unlike the other things that we'll talk about, where we just kind of tack the word rotational or angular in front of it, you know, angular speed, angular uh, uh, velocity, angular acceleration, uh, angular force, if you will, is pretty much given its own word called torque. So what we end up with is this. So uh, if you recall, we had uh, the whole conversion stuff. Uh, so we, I just added on this new line that now uh, any equation that we had a uh, force in, you know, any equation with F, we can technically replace it with torque, tau. Uh, that's, this is the symbol for torque. Uh, it's like writing uh, the pi. So you give it a little curl top and then curl on the bottom, just a fancy T. Uh, and the equation that relates the linear force to the uh, torque is given as tau equals fr. Now, I put a little star here because I wanted to point out that if you notice, this kind of breaks the mold compared to the other ones. Um, I want to uh, make sure that you didn't think that these three equations were the rule rather than just uh, a happenstance. So if you'll see here, we have linear values on the left, and then on the right we have angular times r. And that's true for the uh, velocity and the acceleration. But if you look for torque, it's the reverse. We have angular on the left, and then it's a linear times r. Uh, so you just have to kind of be aware that not every equation is going to follow the, um, uh, the distance, the velocity, and the acceleration conversions. Uh, the good thing, though, is that this is actually on the reference table, so it's not like you have to memorize it. Uh, and then we uh, nothing really was added to this. This was still the you know, relating the linear equations to the rotational. Now, you might be thinking, well, that must be it, right? There's nothing else that's got a rotational version. Like, is there going to be a rotational time, rotational mass as well? Well, uh, not rotational time. That wouldn't make sense because time's time. You know, time is its own thing. Uh, it doesn't matter whether we're moving or not moving or rotating. You know, time works the same way, sort of. Uh, but when it comes to rotational mass, that's not the same thing. Uh, you might think that uh, with the other ones, you know, moving in a straight line versus being angular makes sense because of the fact that uh, those, those values are vectors. Displacement, velocity, acceleration, force, those were all vectors, but mass is a scalar. So how could a scalar have um, an effect based off of, you know, changing direction? But if you think about it, uh, if you have a pipe and you have uh, masses really close to the center and you try to rotate the pipe, that's uh, not that's going to be a lot easier to do than if you had those masses at the very ends of the pipe. Uh, and that's because of the fact that uh, mass, the way it's distributed and the way it rotates will change how much effort is uh, necessary and needed. To do that you know rotating a uh, you know taking a ruler and rotating it along its uh, long axis versus along the short axis you know the you know lengthwise uh, versus uh, through the uh, side through the top uh, will result in 
a different effort required to do that. So uh, the rotational version of mass is actually called rotational inertia. Inertia being the word for mass, essentially. And it's represented by the symbol I. And again, similar to how mass was how resistant an object was to changing its motion, rotational inertia is the same thing, but we're going to add in the uh, stipulation that it's the, uh, how resistant it is for the object to change, uh, to change its rotation. So uh, an interesting thought would be, so if we do have a rotational mass, we do have a rotational acceleration and a rotational force, and we've already seen how these linear equations we have have been rewritten into the angular case. Does that mean that there's a rotational version of f n equals m i? And I could do the exact same trick that I've done before. The rotational version of force is tau for torque. The rotational version of mass is I, rotational inertia. And the rotational inertia of acceleration is alpha, angular acceleration. So we get tau net equals I alpha. So this is going to be our, uh, you know, likely F net equals MA equation for this unit. So here we go. Uh, I've added the F net equation down here. So this is uh, just another equation to kind of show the comparison. Uh, once again, now uh, we can replace any equation with mass in with the symbol I, and you know it leads us into the rotational version. Now, uh, this thing's actually the important part, uh, the equation for I. This is uh, also not on the reference table, or at least I'm pretty sure it's not written uh, in any useful way. Uh, but you'll notice that I have this. This is not a symbol. This is a blank. Uh, this blank is here to, uh, because... The value of i is different depending on the way the thing is set up. Uh, different objects will have different rotational inertias based off of, as I said before, how its mass is distributed or how uh, it's rotated. So every rotational inertia is written in the same form with mr squared, but they'll have a different coefficient in front uh, that is dependent on shape, size, uh, distribution, and rotation. Uh, usually it's a factor, some number less than one. Um, I don't think there's usually going to be a one greater, but it could. Uh, so these are a bunch of examples. Now you do not have to memorize these. Um, these are not things that you'll be tested on. Uh, maybe in class or for homeworks, you might, uh, I might forget to give you an I term, uh, and that's just because you have your notes available. But on the test, if I wanted you to calculate or uh, use the uh, value of i for calculation, I'll give you the equation. So I'll have to give you that we're dealing with the uh, rotational inertia that's one half m r squared. Uh, but you could see here that we have examples like uh, the solid disk rotated around uh, this axis, or the solid disk rotated around uh, the middle point. And you'll see how the equation is a little bit different. Uh, in this case, it was one half m r squared, while in the other case, it's it's written weird again. But one quarter m r squared plus one twelfth m l squared, where the length, how long the cylinder is, actually now matters. Uh, again, rotating the hoop around the um, around the what they call the symmetry axis versus the diameter. The difference is uh, just one m r squared versus one half. Uh, solid sphere versus thin sphere have different rotational inertias and again rotating the rod from the center and the ends. Uh, like I said, they could change this. Uh, there are a variety of different ways. These are the most common, but I could rotate the rod around uh, the, not the center or the end, but somewhere in between. So that's why I was saying that you don't uh, need to memorize these. You'll be given them. The only thing that you're going to need to remember is this, that the rotational inertia of the hoop is always greater than the rotational inertia of the disk. Now we can see that in the equation, that the disk, which is what this is, and the hoop, uh, the disk is less than the hoop. Uh, conceptually though, how would you figure this out? Because as you have uh, should know by now, I try to avoid having you memorize things. I always try to show you how you could figure things out on the test using what's uh, available to you. 
So how could we figure out that the hoop is greater than the disk? Well, if we try to think about the difference between these two, uh, the main difference actually comes from distribution of, of the mass. In the solid disk, oh, I can't draw that. In the solid disk, the mass is distributed all along here. So there's mass uh, at the very end, there's some mass up here, uh, all throughout. So essentially, when I rotate this disk, uh, all the mass is really concentrated right about here, somewhere between the edge and the center. That's at least rotationally. That's how we can imagine it. For the hoop, though, because we're considering a very thin hoop, all of its mass is concentrated at the end. So what we essentially have is their mass is being the same, but the R value, if you will, being a little bit different with one having that uh, the mass uh, further away on average from the center than the disc where uh, a lot of the average mass is much closer. So that's kind of the way that you want to think about it is, well, how is the distribution of mass? How far away is the center of, of the mass on average from the center? And since the hoop has the greater distance, that means uh, the hoop is going to have the greater rotational inertia. All right. Um, so this uh, leads into kind of, I think I mentioned this already before, of how to actually start doing some of these problems. Uh, like I said in the previous questions that we've done, uh, you didn't really have to worry about this too much because it was just uh, plug and chug kind of, where it was very clear what equations you have. But uh, now that we're starting to introduce a lot more of these equations and especially a lot more of these weird terms, uh, one of the things that will really help when you go to do a problem is to essentially reword the question as if it was linear. And then ask yourself, how would I answer it this way? So a perfect example would be, in a question, you're given the torque, the angular acceleration, and the rotational inertia. Uh, so what you would ask yourself is, OK, what if I was given the force, the acceleration, and I'm asked uh, to find the mass? Well, in this case, the linear case, I would use F net equals ma. So I'm going to use the uh, angular version, which is tau equals i alpha. Whatever you do in the linear case, you just replace the linear terms with the angular, and there you go. All right, so let's do some practice questions. Pause the video itself, and we'll go over in a second. All right, so for the first part, it wants to find the angular acceleration. So again, I could look at this. Uh, they're giving me the, uh, the force. They're giving me the mass. And they're looking for acceleration. I need F net equal, I'm going to use F net equals MA, so I'm going to use the tau equation. Now the one difference is that I have to figure out what this mass is. They told me the equation for the rotational inertia, and they gave me the length and the mass. So I'm going to plug these two numbers into my rotational equation that was given. I get that my rotational inertia is 83.3. Then what I can do is use the equation tau net equals I alpha plug my numbers in, and I am getting that the rotational acceleration is 0.5 radians per second squared. Uh, part B uh, wants us to figure out what the final angular speed is after it's been accelerating for 8 seconds. So again, it wants to know the rod's final speed. Uh, it's accelerated for a certain amount of time. Uh, it doesn't say it, but velocity, the initial velocity is zero. So uh, I guess because it well, begins to rotate. So uh, normally in the linear case, I would use V equals V naught plus AT. So I'm going to use omega equals omega naught plus alpha T. Plug my numbers in. End up getting uh, this as my final angular speed. All right, here's the next question. Pause the video itself and we'll go over in a second. All right, uh, so part A ends up being the same thing as before. Uh, I want to first start off with finding out what that rotational inertia is. So plug the numbers that were given into the equation that's given. We get that the rotational inertia is 9. Uh, once again, I'm going to do tau net equals I alpha. The only difference here is I don't have the torque. So 
This actually results in me having to go back to the dynamics. This is an Atwood machine. This is pulling down with a force of 150 newtons. This is pulling down with a force of 100 newtons. This mass is going to cause it to accelerate downward. This mass, on the other hand, because of the way the pulley works, is accelerating upwards. Therefore, if I want to find out what the net force is, I have to do some of the forces. 150 is one force. It's going in the same direction of acceleration, so I make that I keep that positive. But the 100 newton force here is going in the opposite direction of its acceleration. So that's minus 100. So what I'm going to do for the tau net is I'm going to take the difference in those forces, which is 50, and multiply it by the radius of the of the pulley because each one is being uh, um, equal acting equally distant from the center. Uh, I will point out that this is not necessarily something that you can say. Uh, that. Uh, it only works if every force is acting the same distance away. Uh, if you are going to find tau net, you actually have to do uh, the torque of one of them plus the torque from the from another one, and so on and so on. All right. But in the end, uh, you end up getting that the angular acceleration is sixteen point seven radians per second squared. Now, for part B, it wants us to sketch the graph of the pulley's angular speed as a function of time. Again, the best way to approach this is to think about it linearly. In the linear case, uh, we've, we've dealt with these problems where objects are experiencing constant accelerations, velocity, oh, where is my pen? A velocity versus time graph that's experiencing a constant acceleration would have a velocity graph with a constant slope, since slope equals acceleration. So if I just replace the word velocity with angular velocity, my equation looks exactly the same, because just like before, our angular acceleration is constant. This is my symbol for constant. And the slope of my graph is the same as the angular acceleration. So if my angular acceleration is constant, then my slope has to be constant. Right? So like I said, always uh, relate it back to the linear cases. That really helps a lot of these cases and these problems. So uh, we're going to end up uh, talking about more things. Again, one of the weird things is that there's going to be a lot more um, uh, things to add in you know we're going to go into a little bit more talking about torque we'll see how energy plays a factor with rotation how momentum does you know our conservation laws um, the but the key thing is to always go back to think about it in the linear case and then replace all those uh, terms with their Greek counterparts those uh, you know the alphas and the omegas and, and taus and, and all that if you have any questions, feel free to let me know. Otherwise, good luck and have a great day.